Before we uh, start, I do want to give a quick shout out to our friends at PJ Library who have been so generous in helping to support our HF Gather series. So thank you so much, PJ Library, for your support of this series with us. Um, Allison, it looks like you and I can just go ahead and talk to Sarah Abbott and do the interview while we try to figure out where Sarah Aronson is. Oh, here she is. I made it back. She's here. Welcome she back. made it back just in time for the introduction. Excellent. Happy to have you here. Go ahead. Wonderful. So I do want to say a very special welcome to everyone here at HF Gather. Um, we're grateful to have Sarah Aronson and Sarah Jane Abbott with us today. It has been a few weeks since our last gather on a Wednesday, um, and we have missed you all so much. Uh, thanks to Sarah for bringing back this special Writer Wednesday Highlights Foundation Gather. Um, we'll be doing this once a month now so we can continue these important conversations about writing and creating beautiful, authentic books for our youth. So thank you, Sarah and Sarah Jane for coming along with us. Uh, this morning, um, as expected at an HF Gather, we'll listen to Sarah Jane and Sarah in conversation and following their talk, writers can ask questions using that Q&A feature. So don't forget if something um, sparks a burning question to place that right in our Q&A feature and we'll get to just as many as we can after the talk. Um, a little bit about our host, Sarah Aronson writes everything from picture books to novels. She loves to work with writers and is always very, 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 very excited to talk to anyone, writers or not, about the last great book that they read. Thank you for hosting Gather, Sarah, and for all the gifts you're giving our community. Editor Sarah Jane Abbott works with writers at Paula Weissman Books and Beach Lane Books. She is a self-professed bookworm, which I love. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And she is an advocate for picture books with big heart and lots of surprises. Her interests span fiction and nonfiction, picture books through middle grade novels, forthcoming, Sarah has shared um, a picture book that she helped work on, Harlem Grown, written by Tony Hillary and illustrated by Jesse Hartland, an inspiring true story about Tony's community farm and his work with children in gardens and in promoting sustainable eating. Thank you for sharing that with us, and I'll place a link to that forthcoming title in the chat today. Thanks for being with us, Sarah Jane, and for sharing some of your projects uh, along the way today in this conversation. We'll take time now to enjoy this chat between Sarah and Sarah Jane. And then, as I said before, we'll get to as many questions as we can just following their conversation. With that, I'll turn things over to the two of you. Thank you. Um, so welcome back, everyone. It's been... Um, I've missed these chats in the, on Wednesday mornings. Um, if this is your first HF Gather, you should know that we talk about the three C's. We talk about community, of course, the foundation of everything we do, as well as creativity and curiosity. Um, I, of course, am always play and how to dig deep into whatever story you are writing. Um, I'm so happy to be here with Sarah Jane, but first I'm going to ask you to close your eyes so I can show you everyone the word of the day, which sometimes, which we know I have not been successful. Close your eyes. All right. That's the word. It, all right. It's, it's safe. You can look. It's safe. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so if I, if Sarah Jane says that word, or if I say that word in desperation to hear that word said, um, you can um, take a sip of whatever you are drinking this morning or this afternoon. So welcome, Sarah Jane. Um, let's start with the question I start with every single week. Um, what is your process like right now? And how has it changed? How are you keeping that creative worm um, Blame. Oh no, it looks like Sarah froze again. But um, 
yeah, it's been a process trying to get used to working from home and um, being in this environment. You can see my uh, glamorous new office space is right in front of our refrigerator. Um, so I've tried to establish a routine for every day um, to give myself a little more normalcy. So um, I, you know, wake up, do some yoga, get dressed in real clothes. That was a big thing, um, switching from athleisure to actual work clothes. Um, and then I start the day by reading my publishing newsletters, um, Publishers Weekly and Publishers Marketplace, um, and then go through email and work on admin tasks, and then hopefully in the afternoon reading submissions or editing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough to keep feeling creative and productive in the, such a stressful environment, but um, just trying to take a lot of breaks and um, do a lot of reading to sort of recharge my battery. And um, while we're waiting for Sarah to come back, talk a little bit about kind of your, your process with um, books that you're working on and what stage you're working on with those versus when you get time to review new manuscript submissions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, usually the, the books that I'm actively editing are um, obviously the priority, so that takes a, a bunch of time. And I, I used to read submissions on the train. I had a like one hour commute both ways, so that was my submission reading time. But of course I don't have that time anymore, so sometimes I do a little bit um, on the weekends or um, earlier in the morning before I start working. So I didn't hear some of that answer, but I'm going to um, assume that um, reading is reading um, and that um, that communicating with with the uh, with your with your fellow editors um, might um, might be a little bit different, but still happening. Yeah, we keep in touch. Um by texting, obviously email. Um, we have something called Microsoft Teams where you can, you know, chat online essentially. Um, and lots and lots of Zoom meetings. I know. I mean, I, I guess I'm used to them now, but I'm still not used to seeing me talking. Um, I, that is the hardest part. Um, tell us about what it feels like. I know that all writers, know what it feels like to get the letter that an editor is interested. What is it like to read a manuscript and know, I want to edit this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's really exciting to find something that you connect with um, and that feels fresh and interesting. And, um, you know, I know that a novel is something I want to pursue if I just absolutely can't put it down. Um, a lot of novels I'll read maybe a few chapters and then get busy and do something else and if I kind of forget to go back then that's uh, you know a sign that maybe it isn't for me um, mm -hmm. and when I read a picture book I really love I, you know maybe there's a character I connect deeply with or um, yeah, mostly for picture books, it's just something that feels fresh and different because so many manuscripts are kind of a variation on um, common themes, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that when, uh, when I read a picture book that lights me up, like that gets me very excited, um, it's, it's, it's also about the voice. And read the rest of the story. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm also a big like manuscript crier. <laughs> like if a manuscript makes me cry, I'm like, all right, this one's good. <laughs> I know that's it's like the five tissues club. Yeah. <laughs> if I use five tissues, it's a book I love and three tissues like um, instead of stars. <laughs> yeah. I like that measurement system. Right. Um, I also, but are you a crier in general? Like is crying? Yeah, same. 
I think I was watching a video of um, some old dance recital performances and I started crying at the end, just listening to the cheering. I'm like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> I know, sometimes I cry during like touching commercials. <laughs> I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, they know how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. They're stories. I mean, I think that when a character changes and does something really big, like that, I'm going to cry. I, I mean, I'm emotionally invested in how that character overcomes what is, um, what is happening to them. And it's good for me to cry. All my students know that I don't like it when the characters cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, one of my recent favorite picture books that I tell everyone to read is um, Julian as a Mermaid. And that one is definitely a five tissue book. It, I was at a conference once with um, Jessica Bagley and she was talking about the book. And then I was looking at her and tearing up and she was tearing up and we were both crying, but it's just a book where the character goes on a journey of kind of self-acceptance, mm -hmm. but also is looking to his grandmother to accept him as well. And of course she does. And it's just... So it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it's, you know, when, when we talk about hope at the end of a story, it, those books that make us cry, I think it's because we see the future and we want it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The better place. It's so exciting to think that, you know, you're creating these hopeful books about sort of self-acceptance and, um, those kinds of themes and that they're gonna end up being in the hands of a child and hopefully helping them, you know, grow up and be sort of a strong, self-assured person. Um, it's really a privilege to work on it really kids. Is. It really is. Um, my granddaughter right now is obsessed with Click Clack Moo. Aww. And so I think that this is the first book she's been obsessed with and she, um, and I think it's like, she's learning advocacy. It's a good one. <laughs> um, so tips for writers. So we know what we want to end up with. We know how we want you to feel when, we are, when you are reading our books. Um, are there things that you tell all your writers that we at home could, um, could take advantage of? Let's see, I mean, whether you're writing a picture book or a novel, I think crafting a character that is going to be uh, sort of relatable and emotionally engaging is really important. Um, when I, I give a talk about picture book craft and um, some of the things I mentioned for creating a character is like, what are you expressing through their uh, their words, whether that's dialogue or narration, also their actions, obviously, um, how other people interact with them or what other people say about them. Um, and just being important to show, not tell. I know everyone says that all the time, but I think uh, sometimes people feel like they have to really explain their character's personality. And it's so much more effective to show those things through um, sort of through their actions or through their voice. Um, in middle grade especially, I, I love to connect with the character's voice and feel like it's uh, unique and specific and that it helps me really get to know that specific character. I think getting, um, getting to find your character's voice is such an interesting journey because sometimes it starts with one word Sometimes it starts with that yearning, but their actions, I mean, I hope my students and get to know your characters just heard that, that actions really show us what a character is about and what they're willing to do. Um, it's, it, it's more important than what they're thinking is what they actually will do in the course of the story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what a character says about themselves or what they, say that they want is different than uh, reality. 
So <laughs> it can be really effective to have a character, you know, if they're like, I'm not nervous about this thing, but then it, their actions and the way that they talk about that thing uh, communicate that they actually are. Um, I think that that's always something that, um, that can be effective in creating character too. Um, even in a picture book, you know, if the text is saying something different than what's happening in the art, um, it creates a really interesting sort of tension that helps to build character. I love when that happens, when the art does, that the art infers something that is not, that is more than just the words. Mm -hmm. um, so on that note, if, how do you feel about art notes? <laughs> that is always a question. I know that um, there's an editor at Simon & Schuster that says, I want no art notes. If they're in the manuscript, I'm going to delete them. I don't want to see them. Um, but I think I take sort of a more middle of the road approach. I mean, as a picture book writer, there are certain things that you just have to give over control of. Um, things like the way your character looks, what the setting looks like specifically, that's the realm of the illustrator. Um, so I say that the most important art notes are when something needs to happen in the art that isn't explained in the text. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, those can be important with the show not tell um, mandate as well. Um, you know, you don't need to give a lot of exposition in a picture book because you're going to be able to see things in the art. So, um, so yeah, if there is like um, an important detail of the setting or an important detail of something that's going to happen in the visual narrative that's um, crucial to the story, then that's a good place for an art note. Right, and when she says crucial, she really means it. I mean, I think that it is so tempting to want to control every little bit of your vision as a writer. And letting that go is where magic happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Creating and, a book is such a collaborative thing. Um, a lot of my edits for picture books is crossing out lines that are going to describe what's happening in the art because you don't need both. Um, the right. text can do something different than the art um, and they work together to tell the story. And um, recently, my friend Barb Rosenstock said something that has really changed how I think about writing picture books. She said that art requires movement. And I keep thinking about that and saying, yes, that like my job in the text is to create this forward motion of the story so that someone can add more to it in art. And looking at my pagination of my stories, I'm seeing where they're standing still and where they need to actually get on with it, kid, get on with it, move. Um, it's been really, that just that one sentence has made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking at pagination can be really helpful for figuring out whether your plot is actually moving or if it's just kind of staying in one place. Um, even, I really like to tell authors to make a paper dummy of their uh, manuscript. Sometimes people think dummies are just for illustrators, but it's so helpful to have sort of a 3D rendering of your manuscript so you can physically turn the pages and see what the experience of reading it will be like. That's right. And, um, and you'll see right away where you have too many words, where it will be hard for the reader to wait to hear your text before they want to turn the page. Um, you'll see that right away on the dummy. Um, that's, it's really, really, it's, it's really helpful. It's also fun to um, get it out of your system and draw your own pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it's helpful too to see um, what text will be on each spread and imagine what the art would be. Sometimes I get a manuscript that, uh, for example, is just essentially a conversation between two characters. And so when you imagine the art, it looks pretty similar on each page. Um, and so that is the kind of thing that a dummy can help you identify and hopefully um, tweak so that the artist has 
the opportunity to create something more dynamic. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing ma uh, marriage to, mm -hmm. um, to be, when it really works, it just, you can't imagine the words without the pictures. You can't imagine the pictures without those words. And um, it's, it's really, it is really a privilege. Um, do you ever do those kinds of techniques with your novelists where you're asking for an outline or, you know, sort of to, um, to, find the places that they need to explore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, every novelist, I think, has different um, processes and how their brain works best. But I'm, I, like, I like lists, and I like things to be very ordered and detailed. So um, I'm not sure. My, my author, Samantha Clark, might be tuning in. But I, I've been known to make um, like Excel spreadsheets of like, chapter one, this is what happens, chapter two, this is what happens, chapter three, and then like color code, like, okay, exposition, here's the rising action, here's the climax, um, you know, and making sure that there aren't multiple chapters in a row that are kind of uh, expositionary and stagnant, and that the tension is high um, throughout the whole manuscript. Um, Sam also just taught me about uh, a technique she uses called the shrunken head method, where it's like you print out your manuscript really, really tiny and then highlight the things that you're trying to look at to see where they fall in the manuscript. Um, Allison McGee introduced that technique to me so that she said, if you see clumps and clumps and clumps of text and no white space or all white space throughout and no clumps of text, <laughs> then you have pacing problems. And mm -hmm. it's really true. You can just look at it and see, uh, oh, this is not working right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I also agree. I, mean, you. I really like to look at the main actions of each chapter. Just that feedback for me works, works to show me, is my character actually doing something? Because if they're just talking to the reader, which would be my first draft, then that's boring, no matter how well it's written, if they're not doing yeah. anything. One of my favorite creative writing professors in college told us never to write a bathtub novel. Uh, <laughs> and what she meant by that is um, like a character that's sitting in the bathtub, just kind of like contemplating their life and thinking about their memories and like, whatever and then at the end of the novel they're still in the bathtub <laughs> so like essentially nothing has happened um so it's, it's make sure your character is not in their head too much i've been in that i've written that novel and the storyboard of it looked like the main action of every chapter was talking and the main emotion was mad and that was it and that's why the book was not good and so it was it then it, you, it created problem solving opportunities to say, why, why am I stuck here? And why is the character stuck here? And what can we do with time and space and setting to give that character something more to do? Mm -hmm. Figuring out how to make your character move and get out of the house and do things is, um, it can be right. challenging, but it, it makes the novel so much more dynamic and interesting. So a lot of people are asking me if, if um, the edit, if the world of publishing and editors are expecting a lot of COVID novels and how, how should we deal with COVID once we're done with COVID? Yeah, I, it's really interesting to think about how this experience is going to change the world for everyone. Um, we've been getting a lot of manuscripts about sort of dealing with fear and sadness and um, and those kinds of things. And I think a lot of the time the trends I see in picture book manuscripts reflect sort of the emotions of the adults that are writing them, which of course writing can be really therapeutic, but um, you know, sometimes I wonder if a kid's actually going to want to read it, you know? Um, I'm editing a picture book right now about a kid's first experience of going to school and the illustrator was like 
should I put masks on the kids? Like, should it be a homeschool? You know, um, ultimately we said no, just give sort of a picture of normalcy, but it will be really interesting to see how the world has changed and how um, illustrating books for, for and about kids will be different um, based on how different their lives are. Yeah. I hope, I mean, I know a lot of people are also thinking that this might be a time for happy books. Yes. Or funny books. Yeah, um, Paula has, has made a mandate that we're trying to publish happy books right now. So, you know, maybe three books, three years from now when the uh, picture books we acquire in this moment come out, every picture book's gonna be happy. <laughs> that's what we wanna read. Right, because we wanna be happy. Yeah. Um, any advice, um, am I, am I still here? Yeah. Good. Any advice for writers in the midst of rejections? Um, and especially those really good rejections that like they went to committee and it didn't happen. Um, what is, um, what is your advice as an editor? Yeah, gosh, it's really tough. I mean, I'm a writer too, so, you know, I know the pain and frustration of that. But um, I think something that's really important to remember is that publishing is so, so subjective. Um, you know, a lot of the times I reject manuscripts that are really well written, would make a great book, good characters, everything done right, but I just don't love it. You know, I just don't connect with it or it's not something I'm interested in personally. So a rejection doesn't always mean that the manuscript is not good. You just have to find that perfect person that's going to um, be a champion for it and have a vision for it. Um, and I, I think writers should be really encouraged by very detailed rejections. Um, we only take time to do that if we actually liked it. Um, and if it goes to acquisitions, that means that the editor really liked it and, and wanted to fight for it and it just didn't work out. Um, at that next level, but um, hopefully that encourages the author to keep going because they're onto something. I agree. I I used to grade my rejections. Um, an A would be feedback, you know, B and, um, you know, that that would be, those would be the great rejections to encourage me to go forward. And the form letter rejections, at least I got something. Like it was, it was validation that you're in the game and that someone read you, which was the first goal, was to be read and for someone to have taken the time. So um, I also want to echo what Sarah J just said is please keep going, is um, determination is the most important thing. Um, this um, on Twitter, someone, Aaron, Aaron, um, and Trotta Kelly was asking, um, what book have you reread the most? And my book that I reread all the time is The Carrot Seed, because nobody believes the carrot will come up, but it, then it does. And so I always believe in my manuscripts as that carrot. So let's do a little lightning round, um, and then we'll take some questions from the crowd. Um, so, do you work with a pencil, a pen, or straight to the keyboard? I love my Sharpie pens for uh, marking up manuscripts. I always print the manuscript and mark it up uh, the old fashioned way and then transfer my edits to um, Microsoft Word with track changes. You know, all of us, our hearts are now beating much faster. Like the old fashioned way. Thank you. Thank you. The old fashioned way. Um, thin crust or thick crust pizza? Ooh, um, thick crust. Really? And you're in New York. That's great. <laughs> I'll trade places with you. I'm in Chicago and dying for some thin. Um, do you ever use Scrivener with your writers or, or are you, or is it really the, um, the spreadsheet that works for you? Um, when I'm editing novels for work, I usually use um, outlines or spreadsheets, that kind of thing. But for my personal writing, I do use Scrivener. 
And it's really nice because you can get the sort of um, overhead outline view. They have the like note cards feature. Um, and you can also easily drag and move chapters within um, the program, which is really nice. I do that the old fashioned way with note cards. <laughs> it's a big mess sometimes. Um, what's the first book you ever loved? Oh, that's interesting. Like the first book in my life? Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a copy of Harold and the Purple Crayon um, that my aunt gave to me when I was three. She like wrote uh, my name and the date inside and a little note and um, it's tattered now but it's also I drew all over the inside with a crayon. <laughs> um, but I see that as evidence that the book really inspired and excited me because I wanted to draw just like the character. So. Are you an I love that. Early bird or late at night? I, think I work better in the morning. Um, I, my partner's always teasing me because I fall asleep on the couch at like 10 p.m. when we're watching movies. So morning is better for me. Um, and um, last, last most important question, dark chocolate, milk chocolate, or do you, have you ever had a Terry's chocolate orange? Ooh. Um, I usually go for milk chocolate, although lately I've been really into dark chocolate peanut butter cups. Mm. I've never had chocolate orange, but that sounds delicious. The Terry's chocolate orange is shaped like an orange, and it has orange, not liqueur, but essence in it. Mm. And you whack it, and it separates into little sections. I think I have seen one of those. Mm -hmm. And then you eat it all. <laughs> Or you, and you, or you hide it in your underwear drawer. Don't tell my <laughs> husband. All right, let's take some questions from the crowd. From Catherine Powell. What is the name of the book that makes you guys cry? The audio cut out. Hmm. Oh, um, the one we were talking about before is um, yeah. Julian is a Mermaid. Julian um, is a Mermaid. Um, I recently um, was crying. Oh, I mean, I've read The Bridge and Padma's book, The Bridge Home, really made me cry. Also, I just recently read Torpedoed by, um, by Deborah Heiligman and oh my, like five tissues. Totally. I Maybe really love eight. That. Sorry. Maybe. I also um, really love After the Fall by Dan Santat. That one gets oh me. My. And I heard him talk about how it's, he really created it for his wife because she was having you know, anxiety and postpartum depression. And knowing that when you read the book, it's just so moving. Um, it really, it really is. It really is. I mean, and knowing, I think, you know, I love, um, I, I love knowing the story behind the stories um, and seeing how that author got to that place is always so instrumental because inspiration comes everywhere, right? We mm -hmm. know that. And um, the more personal, you know, I, I don't know, the, it really hits, that book really hit home for me as well. Um, Linda Marshall writes, sometimes a picture book is a complicated concept, one that can be described in pictures, um, but needs only a few words. Any suggestions for how to make this um, palatable to an editor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially Beach Lane um, uh, acquires and edits a lot of um, really, really young manuscripts, sometimes where there are only a couple words on each page. Um, so a manuscript like that will definitely need more art notes. Um, sometimes in order to not have an art note for every uh, line, you can put kind of like a general summary at the beginning of what the visual narrative uh, you envision is so that it's not kind of disruptive when the editor is reading uh, the words. But um, yeah, that kind of picture book where the text is really minimal will need more art notes and we know that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's, I really like the idea of writing a note to the editor say, with some of your vision because then they can hear that you have that vision, but then look at it, the book, 
and have their own vision, which mm -hmm. is what we want, which re is really what we want. Um, from an anonymous attendee, for those of us who are not good at spreadsheets, could you post a blank spreadsheet example? You know what, I, um, um, do you wanna do that? Or um, Sam Clark, do you wanna do that? Um, I, if we could I post a, um, I can kind of like, uh, you know, one column is the chapter number and then I'll have another chat um, column for like a really quick one or two line summary of what happens in that chapter. Sometimes I also have a column for sort of what part of the story is, exposition, rising action, climax, et cetera. Um, and yeah, sometimes I have another one for, for notes about um, what I think needs to be, uh, you know, tweaked or changed in that chapter. Um, Uh, so yeah, I mean, the, ch the format of the spreadsheet kind of changes based on what the novel is. Um, one of the novels I was editing, for example, have had little um, italicized sections at the beginning of each chapter. Um, that was Sam's novel, and um, I removed the italicized parts from each chapter and put them in one document so that um, a, you, you could read them in order and make sure they were telling a story all together before you uh, separate them into the various chapters. So yeah, different spreadsheets for different things, but it doesn't need to be complicated. Also, um, I want to say to those of you who might feel overwhelmed by the, no, the idea of a spreadsheet, um, know thyself. Um, so it may not be for you if that stresses that's, you about thinking about it. <laughs> or makes you think too much and not let your brain swirl. So sometimes just knowing the first and last line of every chapter is all I need to make sure that my chapters have continuity and that my end, the beginning and end, the places where there are white space, like are good sentences, because we want them to be the best sentences, not somewhere hidden in the middle. And, and that would be better for an author for whom the, the spreadsheet or even an outline feels too restrictive just to check that the story is moving and that each chapter starts and ends in a dynamic place. That's right. And um, because some people will go as far as outlining what all their secondary characters are doing, and that works for them. But if it doesn't work for you, don't feel have feelings of unworthiness because everyone is different. Um, so what is Joanne Levy? Hi, Joanne. Um, what is your favorite part of being an editor? Ooh, that's interesting. I mean, I think it's always really, really satisfying when um, you send edits to an author and they come back and have just thought of really brilliant ways to address your, um, your questions and concerns um, and sometimes ways that you wouldn't have even imagined. Um, and of course, holding the finished book in your hands is really rewarding. Um, I also love matching illustrators with picture book texts. Um, it's so interesting to try and visualize what you think the, the book will look like and then pick an illustrator that corresponds with that vision. Um, I, I mean, I'm just going to speak to my own experience. It was the most delightful surprise. To see, um, to see your words turned into pictures, like just blew me away. I still, I still look at it and I can't believe it. It was, it was amazing. For writers about to go on submission in the middle of the summer, which maybe there's a rule about don't submit in the summer or don't submit in November, or what's their rule about, you know, submissions. Um, do you have thoughts on when is a good time to submit um, so that, the, you, that this author doesn't get lost in the inbox, especially if they don't have an agent? Right. Um, 
I mean, there are really no rules <laughs> in publishing. There's an exception to every rule. But um, I mean, I get submissions and I read submissions all throughout the year. Um, publishing does tend to be quieter in the summer. You know, we have our summer Fridays and a lot of people are on vacation, so things move slower. Um, fall is a really busy time um, with just big books publishing and that sort of thing. Um, so people might take a little bit longer to get back, but also people are back from summer and ready to go and excited to, you know, um, be reading and acquiring new books, so. Um, I suspect, I mean, nobody may, people may not realize this. When do you actually do your reading? Oh gosh, um, mostly on my commute, which I no longer have anymore. <laughs> And uh, like while I eat lunch or on the weekends, um, sadly, I don't actually just sit at my desk and read all day. <laughs> that's not that's, comfortable. <laughs> that's what we want to believe you're doing. When we, because waiting is so hard. We think, what are the editors doing all day? What is your day filled with? Um, I mean, a lot of my day is filled with kind of more um, administrative things like um, preparing contracts, applying for copyright, um, writing tip sheets, which are sort of info sheets that we give to the sales team so they know um, key points about each book. I also write flat copy. Um, and then hopefully at the end of the day, I have a few hours to actually edit and work on my, my books that I'm editing, so. Yeah. Um, just because she said she writes flap copy does not mean that we should not be writing flap copy. I think flap copy is one of the best things you can do to understand your book. So um, if, you're, if you're struggling with what your book is about, try to write your flap copy. Mm -hmm. um, last question, what's on your wish list and or are there any holes or gaps in your offerings that you are looking to fill? Um, I'm always looking for young fictional picture books. Um, I'm editing a lot of nonfiction picture books right now and especially bios. So I'm really looking for things on the fiction side. Um, really looking for books by and about um, diverse voices and experiences um, and also LGBTQ um, related picture books I think is such a, a gap in the market um and in middle grade i really love magical realism mystery horror um light fantasy so looking for all that generally <laughs> yeah i think i mean it is um yeah it must be exciting when you find that when you when you get what you want <laughs> and yeah. there it is yeah, it's like hunting for treasure, you know? It's so exciting when you find something you really connect with. Yeah, as you know, as we all feel that way as readers. Um, any books that you can recommend to us today? Ooh, let's see. Um, the Boy, the Boat, and the Beast, obviously, by Samantha Clark. Um, and a picture book I edited that just came out is The Secret Rhino Society. Um, by Jonathan Jacobs, illustrated by Samantha Cottrell, and it is about three friends, a hippo, a worm, and a sentient light bulb, and they all share a love and admiration for rhinos, so they form a club where they can appreciate them, um, but then they meet an actual rhino for the first time, and she is not what they expect. Um, and Samantha Cottrell is an incredible illustrator who she makes these like three-dimensional dioramas and then photographs them. Um, so the art is just so different from a lot of what's out there and she's just brilliant. Um, I, I am going to recommend today, I'm reading Bored and Brilliant. Um, how spacing out can unlock your most productive and creative self. I'm looking for validation. I also, I also just finished Every Missing Piece by my friend Melanie Conklin. 
definitely bring your Kleenex. It's fantastic. If we're doing um, adult books, I'm reading um, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, which I know most people read that like a long time ago, but it's just, I haven't laughed out loud while reading a book so much in a long time. And it's also just like so emotional and moving and it'll just make you cry. Uh, I, really I listened to that book and uh, um, the, the audio is amazing. Um, I, yeah, she, uh, she was an, she's an amazing character. Mm -hmm. um, I also, recently I just read less. I was like, I just way. read last two. That's it so, was so that was good. Read. Oh, I have been trying to find someone that has read the book to discuss it with because that last line, I just <sighs> will never get it out of my mind. It was so good. I it love really a book. You really want it to go a certain way, but it doesn't seem possible. And then it just does <laughs> go that way. And you're like, yes, so exciting. I know, surprising and inevitable. It's like, yeah. it's like, oh, it's the, oh, I can't believe it. And of course, and I feel like, yeah, it's so satisfying. It brings out the hand motions. Yeah. All right, so I will say that my streak is alive. My word was not said. Oh no, feedback, interesting. Yeah, it didn't <laughs> happen, it's okay. I hope everyone had lots of um, coffee and um, um, anyway. And um, the last question is about submissions. Um, are you, do you read submissions from conferences or is it only um, agented submissions? Um, so SNS officially is closed to unagented submissions. Um, so most of my submissions come from agents, but um, when I attend a conference, I will kind of open to submissions from attendees of that conference for a certain amount of time. Um, I do have a pile of like a hundred of them on my side table right now that like looks at me and gives me guilt every day. But um, yeah, I, I do read them all and respond. It might take me six months, but I, I will respond. That's great. We know, we know that, that, that those conferences mean a lot of reading. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me and for tolerating my bad connection, which this has never happened before. Zoom is always a, a struggle. You're a great connector. You're connecting all of us, Sarah. You did a wonderful job. I love that there were fellow spreadsheet uh, fans that I think is so great. Sarah Jane, thank you for sharing that. And uh, Sam also. And I also, um, I'm a big fan of the shrunken manuscript uh, strategy. Actually, Darcy Pattison has a video on our YouTube channel where she explains the shrunken manuscript and um, how to kind of go about that strategy. So if anybody was intrigued um, in, in hearing that, sometimes people will walk past and I'll do that an awful lot. I'll have it, you know, very teeny tiny. What are you doing? Can you even see that? But yes. You can see it with fresh eyes when you do that. So thank you for sharing those strategies too. Thank you all for having me, Sarah and Allison and George for organizing and um, everyone for having me here. It's nice to see fresh faces first thing in the morning and <laughs> connect with people. So yeah, very nice. Thank you. Thanks everybody. And uh, one last special shout out to PJ Library for helping to sponsor this and help us keep rolling so we can continue to do this programming. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Yes, Great thank day. you. Thank you, George. Thank, thank you, you, Allison. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Thank, thank you, writers. Yeah.